Hey, this is, this is Josh Hewitt, the host of Straight to the Bar Gym Chats, and today we have uh, uh, a small roundtable discussion here uh, for Gym Chat number 213, and we're going to talk about, all about how to get bigger and stronger. So we're lucky to have Jason Paris and Sunit Sebastian with us today. Um, we had two other guests scheduled. We hope to get them on in a future Gym Chat um, and they couldn't make it, make it uh, this evening. Something comes up, and which does happen with the group, uh, the group interviews. But let's get right into it, Jason. Uh, you've been on before. Um, I know. I really appreciate you, ma appreciate you making it here. Uh, apparently, you you are at the airport and waiting to pick someone up, and you still were able to join us for a few minutes. So we understand you might have to run shortly. So uh, can we just hear a little bit about uh, briefly about yourself and uh, how uh, what your background is related to? Uh, strength training and uh, you know working on mu building some uh, some lean muscle. Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me back again. Um, I, I started out as a track and field athlete, and I've always been into into track. And I was coaching it, and I wanted to I wanted to work with athletes. When I finished doing track, mm -hmm. I found that it took it took so long to progress track athletes. So I said. I want to do something else still related to sports, and then I got into strength training, and from there I, I work with a bunch of athletes like rugby, track, football mainly, and I really enjoyed how you can take somebody from, from anywhere and you can quickly progress them with, with weights, and you can either make them a better athlete, you can make them in better shape, you can even work on their, their mental aspect, people who get in shape also feel better about themselves. So uh, that's a short version of, of how I got into Absolutely. And with a lot of those rugby guys and football players, I'm sure you had to look at helping them put on a little bit of meat as well, right? Yeah, definitely with the like the linemen and well I worked in the in the college setting with the football. So you mm -hmm. had a lot of kids that would come from high schools that didn't lift at all. And I worked with a division one team, so if you want to play in that league you can't be a skinny little guy. You need to have some kind of mass on you that supports Absolutely. You're playing against the, the other big guys. Yeah, for sure. And that not only for uh, for being competitive, but for injury prevention. That's something, uh, if we have time before you have to take off today, I'd like to get into the whole idea of strength training and young athletes, uh, and there's some stereotypes around that. Uh, but before we get into that, thank you very much, Jason, for the introduction. Uh, Sunit, thank you for joining us today. Um, Sunit was looking forward to a, a great uh, a group discussion here. We had a number of guys coming in. We'll, we'll set this up again, uh, Sunit, because yeah, we definitely like throwing around ideas between uh, different pros in the industry. But thank you so much for being uh, with us here, Sunit. Uh, can you just give us a brief introduction about uh, yourself and, and uh, your background? Well, my story pretty much uh, starts off with me being a... Uh, I play like... Jason mentioned he was talking about him being a rugby athlete and training a rugby athletes. Well, I played basketball. And in my childhood years, when in school, I was this chubby little kid. And one day, I'm like, okay, you know what? I want to get in shape. And what I did was probably what any other uh, teenage kid would do if he's really interested in getting losing weight but doesn't know where to start. I stopped eating junk. I mean, I stopped eating entirely. <laughs> and I just played, played ball, and I got skinny as hell. So I was so skinny at one point that maybe if you'd look at me, I'd probably look anorexic. Mm -hmm. So what I had, what I went is I had full circle, but from fat to really skinny, and from there I really had to build a strong base for myself and get stronger, <laughs> put on muscle because I had a lot to work with. So that's where my story starts, and it's all about it starts from there, and I go on to learn the science about it and start researching more and more, and then build it block by block. And now, as you can see, there's a big difference in what I used to look like from four years back and now. So, Absolutely, right. yeah. I mean, what we should do is get a screenshot of of, uh, of you too. I mean, it's a it's <laughs> it's a pretty awesome transformation. Um, I'm gonna include links at the end of this interview um, for both of you guys. So uh, if people want, I definitely suggest anyone watching this go check these guys out on their own pages and their own uh, websites as well. Uh, and you can see what they're into. You you can see them. You got to see these guys are. are Built like brick shit, how shit houses, pardon the expression, but uh, <laughs> definitely go check them out there. They know what they're talking about. Um, Jason, let's get right into it. Um, I want to talk about strength training and building muscle today because a lot of people are interested in that, um, and they're definitely related, but there are some differences between training specifically for 
all out strength, maximum strength, and training just to put on muscle mass. Would you mind uh, talking from your perspective? What are you know, how are they obviously strongly related? But what would be some differences? Uh, the major major difference is the the, the load that you use uh, for when you're building building strength. I use two different modalities. I like to use maximum weight and sub-maximum weight. So the maximum weight you're looking at at around the three rep range. So you want to do singles, doubles, and triples. And then for the sub-maximal part of that aspect, you're looking to be able to fire muscles as quickly as possible. So this is something I learned from, I think it was Jim Windler, and he does, he likes to do a dynamic effort. And that kind of comes from my, my track background, too. So we also do a lot of plyometrics. So that's kind of the, instead of doing a plyometric with your, with your, plyometrics for your body, he's like jumps and all those things, bounds. But if you do take that same concept and apply it to weight training, you would just use a, a low that you can easily move quickly. And on for the aspect of building muscle, it becomes more of a, a time under tension factor then. So now you're going to be using lighter loads so you can get more reps in. So generally you're looking at uh, the 8 to 12 to 15 range for, for building muscle. And I like to keep it into like the 40 to 70 second time frame for your each set. Okay, great. So you tied in there with strength. You're saying that you you would you you would incorporate power as a as a factor to train as well, especially with your athletes. So you would work on some explosive movements or trying to accelerate the weight, uh, as well as all out max effort strength. Exactly. Part of part of the strength is being able to have all your muscle fibers be able to fire at once. So if, when you, when you do high pressure you fight training, your muscles. Your body, your body wants to take the easy route, so when you, it uses as least amount of muscle fibers as possible. But when you use, do the strength and the high explosive stuff, and you're teaching your body to say, I need to use every ounce of muscle fiber I have right this second, as opposed to the hypertrophy that says, okay, I'm just going to use and then Once that gets tired, I'm going to recruit on other muscle fibers. With the hypertrophy type training, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Like a gradation, a gradation effect where, yeah, you'll, you'll, the closer you get to fatigue, the more fi fibers you're going to recruit as you get yes, through the exactly. rep ranges. Um, okay, so let me, let me jump over to Sunit, and I know uh, I've talked to Sunit before, uh, and some of the stuff I've also, we've talked about time under tension and whatnot. Um, so be prepared, Jason. He might not, there might not be, uh, there might be some uh, different opinions and different views, and that's what we're here for. So that's great. I want to hear um, uh, how you would approach that. Like, first of all, just that simple question of what's the difference? I'm training for strength. Why isn't that the same as getting? If I lift heavy weights, aren't I not just gonna get bigger? What are some factors that might be you might need to consider that are a little different if you want to put on some muscle? Uh, and then, uh, what would be some of the the key factors that you would consider for strength training and for hypertrophy training? Okay, so for the first off, right off the bat, the first thing I want to talk about is that a lot of people start associating strength training and hypertrophy as they, they view it as two different goals or some separate entities. But the fact is that for a natural athlete, one that is, that is genetically average and who is not on uh, any pharmaceutical enhancements, for that person, size and strength are inseparable. There is no way where you can get one over the other over a long period of time. So when you're looking at the grand scheme of things, at the end of the day, pursuing strength uh, for the, as a bigger picture will eventually get you big. But there are minute differences if your goal is maximal strength as opposed to maximal hypertrophy and strength as well. There is going to be a difference because there are other factors that come in play. Maybe a person who is focusing on strength would play a little bit more towards the lower rep ranges. Whereas a person who is focusing on hypertrophy would require a little more volume, which he, if he were to do with, say, those low repetitions, he would not be able to do it. It would just uh, fatigue him out. So when it comes to hypertrophy, I like to advise or I like to talk about, see, we mentioned, I think Jason mentioned about how muscle fibers get recruited. So there's a certain point, uh, again, de depending on the intensity of which you're lifting let's say 85% of your one rep max. At that point, your your CNS recruits all the muscle fibers it has. 
it cannot it cannot lift that load unless and until it's recruiting all of its muscle fibers. Beyond that, if you lift a weight beyond your 85% of your one rep max, the CNS achieves that performance based on what's called as weight coding, at the rate at which the muscles are recruited or fired. So that's the distinguish between you know a power lifter being able to lift a one rep max and a person who's lifting say a six rep max. They're recruiting the same number of muscle fibers, but the power lifter is much more <coughs> efficient at lifting that weight because of improved rate coding. And so, that, that has does that have to does that relate to how how uh, their nervous system to some extent like how yes, how good absolutely. are they are there? Yeah, okay. So that, that that's yeah. neural efficiency and that that's a big difference. Like absolutely. okay. So that, yeah, that's so, where, I mean, partly what Jason was talking about, what where we, the explosive uh, effort would come in as well. I mean, a lot of that is being able to recruit the same muscle fibers, but much more efficiently or much more quickly to generate more force in a shorter amount of time. Is that right? Yes, but the, the point that I was getting to was that anything beyond 85% of one rep max, say uh, if a person is trying to look for hypertrophy, he wants to, he should be able to lift a certain weight, the maximum weight that he can lift, along, with which he can do a certain amount of volume. So if your person were to pick, say, a one rep max, which is 100% of your uh, one RM, it would it would significantly lead to less volume. Whereas if a person is sticks to 85% of a one rep max, that will allow them to do maybe six to eight repetitions with a with a decent amount of weight, which gets in a certain amount of volume. At the same time, doesn't overtax their CNS. So that way, there is a distinguish between training for strength and training for size, but it's a very fine line, not to an extreme where you have some people talking about 50 repetitions for muscle growth. Uh, you know, I did a video on my YouTube channel very recently with someone argues about more time on attention that way. And, and if anybody who's checked my work has read my article on time on attention, it's, uh, we probably shouldn't get into that right now. But it's like a very massive critique on it. So uh, Yeah, I saw, I saw that. I saw that article, yeah. We, yeah. I, we differ a little bit on our opinions around that, but I, I, I think in the end, uh, well, both training for hypertrophy and for strength, but especially for hypertrophy, is a multifactorial process. So there are different elements, uh, and I, I definitely think there's a metabolic part to it. There's a hormonal effect. Uh, there's a few other factors, which probably when you get into higher volume training, uh, you're going to get more of that effect than you would from max effort training. That, that those yeah, things, absolutely. but I guess you're right. Time under tension is is a factor. I would have to argue, but I guess what your argument was. This wouldn't be one of the one of the. T there are other factors that would take precedence over that, especially for new lifters and natural lifters, uh, over time under tension being the primary consideration, right? So, for the people who get into the super super slow training to try and cre create more time under tension, they're compromising load, which would be a, a, a more important factor, right? So there, that sort of idea. Uh, and I, I know I've talked to Jason. Yeah. yeah. There's another. There's actually a study that suggested. Uh, those super exaggerated eccentric motions are actually have no significant difference. It's pretty much the same. In fact, actually, it has a negative uh, effect because the loads were reduced. So that there's, a, there's actually a they like the five second negatives and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yes. uh, I, you know, any studies like this, I want to talk to you guys after. Uh, if you're, your own research or where you've got your stuff, uh, I can post those links below. Um, from my own experience, using a controlled eccentric has been much better. But uh, you know. A couple of seconds versus yes. exploding on my on the exactly. concentric, and I think exactly. uh, we talked about that before, Jason, as well. You you tend to, uh, I don't know, you don't necessarily do like a, a five or six seconds super slow negative, but you're you were talking about controlling the eccentric and going hard explosive on the concentric. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really believe in going super slow, but I, you want to. You want to control it and kind of take out momentum from it, and then explode on the, the concentric action. Absolutely, that's exactly the point. But a lot of people tend to like there are some time and attention protocols that suggest like a four second, a five second eccentric, and a two second concentric. Some weird tempos which really make no sense. The idea is to go as fast as you can while eliminating momentum. So at the end of the day, it comes around to maybe it's uh, maybe between one and a half to two seconds for most people. That would be it, but like Jason has said, it's it's eliminating momentum is the main goal, not trying to go super slow. Excellent, thanks, guys. Um, listen, we just got a question from uh, Louis Farone. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Louis. He's watching us here. Um, he's asking, how do I get into your live hangout? So I just sent you an invitation, Louis. Uh, we're at a, a roundtable discussion right now, so we're inviting uh, other people to join us. 
Um, so you should receive a message from your Google Plus um, account or by email. I just sent it to your uh, your Google Plus right now, boom. So you should see a little invitation. You just click on that, and if you have a webcam, you're good to go. If you just have audio, you can join us as well, but you'll just be a static picture and a voice, and that's fine too. Does that answer your question, Louis? Okay, and he's posting here. I don't know if you guys can see the q and A. I just oh, it's a new feature, actually. Uh, the Google Hangouts opened up. It's uh, a live Q&A, so people can type in their questions for us during the show. So Louis may join us here. We'll see what happens with that. Now, <clears throat> let me just grab Jason again because I know you you may have to disappear in a, in a few minutes if you uh, if your passenger comes. But um, I'm just curious about when, when you're working with young athletes and and football players and hockey players and whatnot. <clears throat> um, and not hockey, sorry, uh, rugby. And you have these skinny kids that come on, but they're like, uh, do, you, do you work with youth, I assume, like preteens or like early teens as well? Uh, in, I have in the past, but mostly now it's, I guess... More teenagers and 20s. More, and yeah. 20s. Yeah. yeah, like 18, 19, 20. So let's say, just for the sake of argument, uh, like someone comes to, in a kid... Uh, and at 12 to 14 years old, and their parents say, listen, I don't want him lifting weights because uh, it's going to stun his growth, and uh, it's going uh, to cause growth plate damage, and it's going it's to potentially injure him. What would, what would your, what would you, how would you answer the parent or a concerned youth that's getting into, first of all, they're getting into contact sports, and they're worried about weight training? What would you say? Uh that, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question to kind of deal with <clears throat> when you deal with people's preset opinions. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> if you just want to be blunt, you can tell them like if they, they play, play contact sports, there's absolutely no way that that lifting weights, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be more difficult on them than getting hit in hockey and football and rugby. So, <clears throat> but I, I I tell them that. Strength training is essential to sports, especially contact sports, because uh, you need to. Oh, sorry. Hold on there, Jason. Uh, Paul, welcome to the show. Can you hear me? So, Paul, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Jason. We just got joined by Paul. Paul, this is the first time joining us. Uh, he, I guess he's coming from the U.K., so he might have been a little bit of a misunderstanding with the time difference and whatnot. Um Paul, up in your, if you can hear me, up on the top on the right, there's a thing to click on called settings. It looks like a little bumpy wheel. If you click on that, you should be able to see some settings for your microphone and your and your camera. So play around with that. And we're joined by Louis Ferron. Louis, can you hear me? Okay, this is for um, Louis. There he is. Hey, Louis. I've been in touch with him for a little while there um, trying to, on uh, Google+, Plus, trying to get him to join us. So I'm glad you're here for the, the chat. Welcome to the show. Um, now, sorry to just, uh, just let me take one second, guys. Uh, Paul, uh, just trying to get Paul Marslin on track here. Uh, so, Paul, we may only have you with audio, if you're, if, depending on how your camera is working. But go up to your settings on the top right. Make sure that the settings are good for your camera and mic. Uh, you can see in the top right, and there's a wheel there, settings. Then beside that, you'll see a little link for your microphone and your camera. Make sure those are clicked so that they're on. Or under your picture, uh, Paul, check for your... Um, okay, been talking for a little while there. Uh, find it on uh, Google Plus to get it to join us. So I'm glad you're here for the chat. Welcome to the show. Um, now, sorry, just, uh, just let me take one second, guys. Uh, Paul... Uh, Trying to get Paul on track here. Oh, I'm getting feedback. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> okay. And I was like, wait a minute. Okay, Paul, listen, if you're there, uh, keep working on um, checking out your settings there. If it doesn't work out for you today, just hang out. You can uh, throw some Q&A and uh, feedback in the, on the comment section. Stay with us, though, so that I can work with you after the show and make sure we're set up for next time. Okay, uh, Jason, thank you. Just... Um, so you were talking about, yeah, definitely, the point about contact sports. Uh, you're going to be, there's far more risk of injury 
jumping and colliding with other people and the impact of even just land, hitting the ground and even basketball, like you were talking about, you, you uh, participated in, Sunit, um, the more, far more force entering the body than a, a controlled set of squats or deadlifts. Uh, and if anything, strength training with proper form and a good program is going to help prevent injury. Would you not agree? <clears throat> yes, exactly. That's one of the reasons I'm so for it. You build up the strength and you you learn how to... When you do power cleans, you learn how to absorb that shock and that energy of the weight. So, <clears throat> And then when you do squats, you're just getting used to having an extra load onto you. And a lot of the mechanics are the same. Like when you do a a power clean or your squat, you kind of you have that athletic position that you're going to use in other sports. So even though it's it's not as dynamic as playing sports, it's still kind of working on those same kind of body positions and mechanics and getting stronger in those, those positions. So I, I think it's a, an essential tool in, in a developing athlete. Yeah, I'd agree, and it's uh, it's helping them build some. Uh awareness and control of their body as well, which carries over to any activity. Um, so they're not these awkward, uh, weak, uh, unstable kids throwing out, bumping into each other out in the field. Yeah, definitely. Um, listen, while we, uh, while we got Louie on here, Louie, uh, just briefly, thanks for joining us. Uh, can you just give us a quick introduction about uh, who you are, what you're about, and then uh, we'll pick your brain quickly on uh, the topic of building strength and building mass. Um. For a while here, on, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Hangout Show, but for a while here, I used to do a fitness show over there. Um, it was just like this, question and answer. Um, then for about 10 months, I opened the Hangout in the morning and worked out. Um, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, 5 a.m. A lot of people didn't work out with me. But, you know, it was something that I tried and wanted to try it. Uh, it was free. Everything was free. Uh, I actually you did, worked, you did the workout on on the, the Google Hangout like this exactly. Oh, yeah. oh cool. You, yeah, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of tape versions of Fit Louis Ferron's lunch, power lunch, whatever. Kind of something like what you're doing here, which mm -hmm. is great. Um, and, and it takes a long time for this for people, and it's great that you're doing this. This is kind of why I'm here because I support any fitness group, fitness people, you know that are training the mind and the youth. I've heard what you're doing here. Uh, but right now, I pretty much, I train a class at 545. Someone called me up and wanted me to start training. So I work for a facility now. It's no membership facility. I actually do a CrossFit boot camp, uh, mostly females, and that's not by choice. It's whoever wants to come is allowed. But that's where I'm at. I'm 48 years old, all-natural bodybuilder uh, in 2000, took second place here in the state of Florida. Um, I see most of these people or most of these men that are in this room are big men. And you can just look. I mean, most of us that well, are Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and most of us that are in physical fitness can look at people's faces and know what pretty much the body composition is. Uh, <laughs> Lou Ferrone is 164 pounds. He's never going to be, I'm your, you know, go for the pass guy. Uh, you need linemen. That's how I kind of explain things. You need big guys like you to protect me. Um, but I'm never going to be super big. Um, and when you guys talk about mass and strength, it kind of hurts me because mass is not, <laughs> if I mass out, the abs are gone. You know, I can get up to 190 pounds, but what does that do? It hurts my back. It hurts my knees. Um, you know, I'm not as mobile as I would be right now at 164 pounds. Uh, you know, you guys have been doing this probably as long as I have, or I mean, I don't think everybody in this room is as old as me, but uh, I think I'm maybe Catching you, up to you. I was going to say, Josh, you're probably... 43. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're in good shape. You're what, like six one? Six foot, yeah, two hundred pounds. Yeah. So I envy you guys. I, I, my bosses, they're just big guys. Um, but what I want to say, why we've been talking about mass and strength. A hundred and sixty-four pound man, when he benches three hundred pounds, to me that is like, whoa. I'm not just talking myself. I'm talking other people. When a two hundred pound man benches 300 pounds, that's nice, but 
you know what I'm trying to say here. Relative strength, yeah, relative strength. When yeah. someone is extremely strong pound for pound, and that's what we are sort of touching on before, yeah. at some point there is a little bit of a difference. Um, uh, Sunit is saying it's a very small difference between training for strength or hypertrophy. Uh, I, I, I would sort of slant towards that there may be a little bit more and uh, more of a difference as you become more experienced when you're training for just to get put on weight or or just for pure strength and that's evidenced in sports like powerlifting and olympic lifting where you can have some relatively small people who are so efficient and have uh, become so strong at, at, at their lifts uh that they can outlift any big dude uh in the gym like pound for pound on on any of those pick, those compound moves well and you know I don't I don't want to get off the beaten track what you're talking about it's even like with this new uh, how do I say this? The new fad, or it's just it's epic. It's it's around the universe now. This CrossFit stuff. Um, it's just it's bad. It's it's great stuff. I mean, bad by saying it's bad, like er, bad. You know, um, it's good <laughs> stuff. I've been watching more videos as I get older on sixty-six year old women, seventy-three year old men. Um, that are doing this CrossFit where, you know, when they started, pull-ups were not even in their equation. Uh, but it just goes, like you just said, with constant training, with constant repetition in, okay, today I did 25 push-ups, tomorrow I'm going to do 27. Um, you know, I mean, that's just conditioning, really, right? Yeah, I would say, I mean, that's touching on what I wanted to get into next, too. Um, and uh, we'll move on. Let's see if we have Paul on here, too, is the idea of what are the key principles related to strength training or training for hypertrophy. And that's, I'd say that's a key one right there you touched on is progressive resistance. So you have to have some sort of increasing load or increasing tension uh, over time progressively. You, you have to somehow introduce that continually new stress that the body will adapt to. Um, yeah. I'll save my opinions on CrossFit, but there is definitely different elements to CrossFit. And I think people are stereotype it as the uh, high repetition circuit training type thing, but there is, I know, in a, the uh, the CrossFit template, there is also place for for low rep heavy lifting and uh, and progressions with that as well. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, just a, around. Uh, the idea of progressive resistance. Um, thank you very much, Louie, and thanks for joining us. Stay, stay with us. I want to get into this a bit more, too. Um, oh, first of all, Paul, are you there at all? Any any luck connecting? No, nope, but he's still on here, so I think he can still hear us, and he's joining in, so we'll definitely touch with base with him after, make sure he's set up for next time. Sunit, getting into, like we talked about, is a general overview, strength training versus training for mass. All right, there's uh, some voice. Paul's trying. He's trying to get in, but he can't quite. There we go. Oh! Let me get on. Right. We got a face. Right, can you Yes, I can see you. <laughs> Paul, welcome right. to the show. Okay, let me just end on this. Welcome. Anyway. I have been um, currently to the conversation with regards to aggressive resistance. Uh, my thoughts are on this are the novice beginner progressive resistance is, is a show. As you become more advanced though, I think the emphasis on your strength training is somewhat muted, if you will, because you can't continually to keep getting stronger and stronger. So in my experience what you have to do is look for ways uh, where you can you can still get stronger as such, but the emphasis then becomes more on increasing size. It's it's very much a fine balancing act. So uh, as you become more of an experienced lifter and your strength plateaus, like you're reaching the limits of your strength potential naturally, is that you're saying? Then you would you would yeah, suggest? With, yeah, without obviously you know you're talking you know your average gym training, not obviously your net week. Once you reach a certain threshold, like I say to people, when they're deadlifting and stuff, if they get up to say 500 pounds, once you get up to four or 500 pounds, any weight over that sort of weight is always going to feel relatively heavy. You know, 500 pounds is 500 pounds. Whether you weigh 300 pounds in body weight, a 500 pound deadlift is still relatively heavy. 
then obviously if you progress to say six hundred pound or seven hundred pound, which which I eventually worked up to with a just over seven hundred pound uh, hammer strength deadlift, the, it gets to a point where the stress on your joints and your ligaments, you begin to question how much can you go on top of the risk of injury. We lost your sound, Josh, or I have. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. And then I, I've spoken with strength athletes who, who understand this risk that then they get into extreme loads and then, I mean, sometimes uh, pharmaceutically enhanced past their what their natural capabilities would be. And, and uh, they, uh, they say they understand the risk and that's what they're willing to accept to become, well, and I'm sure anyone that you've seen, world's strongest men, the, the, what, what they do to their bodies I'm sure at some level they understand that this is beyond what is healthy or safe for them. They just want to turn their body into a machine to move as much load as possible, and they accept the risk with that. Um, so beyond that, I mean, if you're willing to say accept that I'm probably going to get injured if I continue down this path to the extreme levels, um, what would you say? What would you suggest when someone does reach that? Just maintain, or would you? Uh, you're talking about then focus on building, building more muscle to to support your frame. But you, everyone has a, a genetic sort of limit to that as well. Where do you go once you just get to your 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 max and then just maintain it? Well, I mean, to a, to a point, we um, touched the, the, on an important point before when we talked about. Um, some of the years. I've been as high as 250 pounds in body weight, and while I felt like crap to be on the come round at that body weight, uh, at the moment now I'm down to 285 pounds, which is, to be, to be honest, is big enough for me. When you reach a point where you think, do do I need to get bigger or do I want to get bigger, and if so, how can I how can I actually do that? then yeah, I guess in some ways you have to accept the fact that you have reached the limit. While you can still progress, the rate at which you progress is a lot slower. So you can't handle up the ways just to maintain what you have. Uh, that's why I'm such a big fan of, as you know, of slow cadence reps, because it allows me to train uh, long term without obviously putting me joints and connected issues at the risk of injury. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now, so, this is, with regards like the likes of world's strongest man, to them. Do you? Can I ask a question real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sure. Do you believe when you're doing this, like same with me when I used to enter bodybuilding contests, and most people that know bodybuilding, there's an off season, the bulking season, and that's when we power lift. We, you know. I call it uh, strength moves, power moves, power lifting. That's when we're going for our size. That's when we're not watching our diet as clean as we would if we were going to go on stage. So do you believe when we as men are doing this, do you believe, like you said, when you get to that certain point, we know, I know when I'm deadlifting 315 off the floor, my bench is at 315 and I'm only 164 pounds um, I know that that's it. Why go any higher at such body fat, low content? Um, do you believe cycling? Like it, when, because I know I can go up to 190, but as I've gotten older, I don't want to be 190 pounds no more. Why? Because at 48, it, it's hard for me to get back down to the 160 and then the skin and everything. But why I'm asking this? Do you believe the cycling kind of helps? Like. Um, you know, I'm going to go up in size a little this winter again. Uh, you mean cycling little, your, your body weight or your the weights you lift? Weight so, and the training. Cardio more or less um, in the summers is what you're I... You're kind of talking about periodization almost. More or less, yes. Yeah. Uh, to answer the question, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think years ago I was very much anti periodization but as I've gotten older and wiser if you will yeah I mean for me now as we approach winter and probably like the, the rest of you guys I, I do actually call me bulk and cycle 
um, because obviously in the winter you can wear bigger co- bigger clothes, so you can kind of hide the <laughs> only weight that you put on. Uh, in terms of training, what I've also found, yeah, I, I like to use a term which I from a guy called Brian Johnston, which fans. So basically what I will do there, Sorry, Paul, at the moment, sorry, you, you cut out there for a second. What was the term? Increased demands. Okay. Okay, so basically what it means is at the moment, my current training is full body workouts, twice per week, six to nine sets for the whole workout using slow cadence reps. I'll do it for a few months. Then when I feel the time, so to speak, I don't have any preset time when I'll I'll do this. I'll then maybe change to a split routine. Um, generally, I do something like chest, shoulders and triceps back and biceps and legs on their own and then I'll increase the volume slightly and obviously I'm training more frequently in the goal of to a little bit more renewed growth um, but at present they're just simply to me the strength that I've got as I say I'm not really looking to in, increase me in some ways I feel I'm about as strong as I'm, I'm, I'm really going to go so why, why risk injury by trying to go heavier and heavier and when he drops down in body weight? It, it, I think it's all relative. Do you know? Um, do you know what I'm saying? It's like if you know, if you can bench 500 pounds, that's great. But what what kind of pressure is it putting on your wrists? Is it not more sensible and more effective to maybe be, maybe bench 300 pounds and really feel the muscles working? You know, I'm a big believer in building strength. And as so much the the demonstration of strength as well, and what you see a lot in gyms is people, you know, which which is fine. You know, if you're capable of say six or seven hundred pound deadlift, and you you know feel that you you know you're, you're in the mood, to, and you're obviously not going to injure yourself, then I say for it. You know, I <laughs> I have this uh, occasionally when I'll go into a gym, and we've all seen them. These guys who basically think they own the gym and they walk around with the chest all puffed out and what generally I do to sort of... Sometimes they do own the gym. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I, I just, well, I, I'll just put five or six plates on the bar and start doing deadlifts and that normally, uh, I'm, why I risk, why risk injury in my back, you know, I've got a back injury now from, as you know, just I, I work as a, a bouncer who, You're you're frozen there a little bit, Paul. Your screen. Okay. Uh, looks like we Paul's with us, but um, and stay tuned. This is something that happens with the gym chats uh, frequently because we have having him come in from England uh, depends on his his connection. Uh, Paul, if you're hearing me, uh, we still have your image here, but your your audio and screen are frozen. But yeah, definitely, I hear the point. Uh, he's saying like um, focusing on the feel of the of the movement uh, and the tension of the muscle. Last discussion, I actually had a gym chat. We're talking about one of the key factors for hypertrophy was uh, focus tension, as well as uh, just how much weight you're going to move. What where are what muscles are you trying to to train? And really focusing on strict technique and and trying to create tension in those muscles during the exercise. Uh, not necessarily talking about mind muscle connection but just really keeping the movement uh, isolated um, and uh, rather than just hammering as much weight as you can and risking injury Sunit, we talk, yeah. talked about a couple of points there that I'm sure you'll have uh, something to talk about I do want to save time at the end of this discussion for um, uh, getting into some other principles like frequency rep ranges etc Good, Louis back with us good um, but touch ta- uh, touching on a couple of things that uh, um, Paul and Louis got into there. Um, did you have any, anything, first of all, that just popped into your head? Yeah, the, the thing is that <clears throat> a lot, some of the points that were made were about how you, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't, you reach a certain limit and what do you do beyond that. See, it's natural that beyond a certain point, the, the speed at which you get your results is going to slow down. But here's the thing, that that's not a cue for one to, to accept that this is the this is all I can go. And then, then go about with the aim of trying to maintain. Because guess what? All of us are not staying static. As we age, 
as with every passing day, the the clock is making us weaker. And I I'm no one to say because I'm pretty young, but then you guys, you know, it's uh as you get older, it's it's like it's like a rope dragging you back. And unless you are by your unless your intent is to move forward, you're probably going to end up getting staying back. If you attempt to move forward, maybe you'll stay in the same position, you know. So that doesn't mean you want to, you you you've got to train uh, balls to the ball all the time. You prob the main thing I guess would be periodization, because to a certain point when you are a beginner, linear progression works very well. You know you 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 do ten reps, okay. Let me add some more weight. Let me add some more weight. But uh, as you go become an intermediate and advanced lifter, periodization becomes something that that has to be in, uh, ingrained into your training program. And uh, if you do it and you do it correctly. There is no reason why not you you shouldn't be able to gain strength on your deadlift and, and uh, squat and your bench without compromising form and technique without injuring yourself, and I think that should be your goal because guess what if you aim to stay at the same place, you're gonna go back gonna because back life is dragging you back. So I would say that you at least aim to move forward. It doesn't matter how small the step is. It doesn't matter how slow you're moving forward. At least you try and you you focus with the intent of moving forward. Then maybe you stay in the same position. Yeah, you got. You have to keep that hunger. Yeah. There's the one constant in life is change. So you, can, you choose if you want to change to, for the worse or you want to try to change for the better. But yeah, it's, I agree. As uh, Now that I'm in my 40s, it's an uphill battle. And if I were just to say, well, I'm going to take it easy now and maintain, I would definitely start to slide. But um, what are your thoughts on that, Louis? I mean, we're, both, we're in our 40s here. We, we can represent the old dogs, old man strength. You know it, and you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, what I want to say is what he said is great because, yeah, time is working against us. And what I want to say with that is these hangouts with YouTube, with everything. I wish when I was in my, like, 20s, 25, and coming up into bodybuilding, I wish there was more information out there. Just when we lost the guy, he said he hurt his back. Now, right now as I'm sitting here um, – Something happened to my shoulder working out. Um, then it went to the neck because I tend not to want to give up. I, I'm not a, uh, I don't like to rest. I don't, and people will tell me that, Louie, you got to stop. you got to go home and rest. We all know resting is the best thing for us to build size, to build strength. Our body needs to recuperate, mm -hmm. and I don't do a lot of that. Um, but what he said makes, uh, it, it's, you know, time is working against us, and, you know, just actually seeing what's good for maybe Josh is not good for Louie. Me and him can train together, but I might not be able to push my body as hard as him. And same if I'm working out with Sunit. Is that how you say that? Mm -hmm. That's Sunit. <laughs> yeah, so if I'm working out with him, he's a young man. Um, He's going to – I've always – you know how when you take a little puppy and put it into the pen with the old dog, the other – uh, the old dog kind of wants to play more because he's got the young dog. So he's going to push me. I work out with my brother that's three years younger. Tall like you guys, 210 pounds in the off season, 195. In the, you know, he's getting ready for a contest here in November. But it, you just got to know your limitations because with this injury, I'm going on my second week. You know and all of us in this room know when your shoulder and neck starts to hurt, I mean, it's pretty much you're a knee – you can kind of baby. Um, you can work your upper body. Um, your back, you still can do certain things where you're sitting with something. But once this in, in, in here starts to, it limits almost everything. And it's just, it's killing me right now. Um, two weeks and I have to train a class. So I can't not. I can I do a few workouts with these girls now, but usually when I do this CrossFit cross training, and they actually implied this, not to get off the beaten track. I used to do a spin class, and the girls wanted to do they wanted to do strength moves. And when your clients are telling you what they want to do, you don't say, "Oh no, this is just a spin class." Mm -hmm. Now we don't even get on the bikes. <laughs> you know what I mean, we shake the ropes, we take the sledgehammer and hit the tires, jumping jacks, uh, you know, burpees, whatever. But uh, what he said, it, it, it's it's definitely here, and, and me and you are the old men, but we just have to watch our nutrition, and we have to get rest. Um, it's a key. Yes. I wonder what sleep feels like. I should start trying that. I, yeah, and I'm with you there, bro. Um, I just now, like at noontime, now i got to tell myself, no more coffee. I'm Italian. I love coffee, <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Exactly. I'm with you there. No. Um, now I want to just get into um, if unless Sunit, unless there's something else you wanted to touch on. I know there's uh, a few thoughts that were thrown out uh, during the discussion that I'm sure we could get into on any one of them. Um, are you okay if we get into just some of the other like? Uh, principles related to absolutely, absolutely. That's okay, so like, just because I'm sure there's some people watching that would want to just get some real uh, fundamentals that they can apply to program design. Um, so if I miss any, you know, jump on it. But if there's anything you could cover real quick around your suggestions around trading frequency, Paul, uh, who was on with us, and thanks for joining us, Paul. If you're still watching, uh, we'll, we'll uh, get on uh, on here and look at that connection with you next time too. Um, but uh, yeah, I was looking forward to hearing Paul's opinion because he used to he, he trained or he did. I'm not sure if he still is with the uh, high intensity training techniques. So we could have got into a real debate discussion around tempo and that sort of stuff. But uh, it was cool to see him hear him talk about periodization and how he started incorporating that because I don't think that was something he was into before. And uh, all of us have sort of are on the same page with some form of periodization as as a way to help progress your training. Um, now, what about getting into like uh, Frequency of training. Paul uh, progresses from full body workouts to getting into split routines down the road. Um, like how frequent to hitting each muscle group, uh, set rep ranges, um, recovery time, length of workout, uh, that sort of stuff. Let's start with frequency first. Sunit, how often should would you say would be ideal to hit each muscle group? For well, the the science when it comes to frequency is pretty clear. That uh, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but the, the the idea is to train the muscle group at least twice a week, maybe twice or thrice a week. Twice a week seems to be an optimal uh, balance between uh, well, you know, between undertraining and overtraining. And the reasoning behind this is that uh, there are quite a few studies that suggest that post-workout, uh, the muscle protein synthesis in a specific muscle that's being trained lasts for up to 36 hours. Beyond that, it completely tapers off. So the theory is that if you are training a muscle group once in a week, and if you're training it once in a week, you're probably going to do much more volume than you were if you were doing it twice in a week. So if you train a muscle group once in a week, say on a Tuesday, uh, the, uh, you say you're say you're training chest. So the muscle protein synthesis in your in your pecs will be elevated for say up to uh, maybe early Thursday, uh, maybe mid Thursday, but that's it. And the rest of the week it's uh, it's not it's not uh, there's no increased muscle protein synthesis over there. Uh, instead of that, the what high frequency or maybe two times a week uh, pro, uh, protocol would suggest is that if you're doing say six or eight sets or ten sets in one session for chest, instead of that, what you could do is you could maybe do two upper body sessions in a week and split those ten sets into five sets each in the respective workouts. So you get the same total volume, but you get higher frequency. And your muscle protein synthesis is elevated twice in a week as opposed to one. So that's where the benefit is, theoretically. And a lot of people, through empirical evidence, a lot of people have also, especially nat natural bodybuilders, and, and just the regular uh, consensus that you have when you, when you find people giving their, their experience, when they incorporate a high, a high frequency protocol as opposed to a normal one, they seem to, it seems to work better for them. So yeah, that's I'd, my I'd, take on it. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree, and I switched it to hitting each muscle group twice a week with a lower upper, lower upper split. Uh, and Paul was talking about doing full body workouts. If you can get the exercises you want into those workouts and without them getting too long, hitting it three times a week, I've even heard that uh, that's been very beneficial as well. Like uh, uh, getting each muscle group targeted three times a week just gets into a, a matter of pra how practical is that with getting the, the exercise you want in without having two-hour workouts. But so um, For most people, I, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, point in something, though. <clears throat> for most people, especially in the, if they're in an intermediate to advanced program, fitting in a full-body workout really won't work that well because let's, let's assume this. Uh, first of all, there's the issue of performance. Now, when you're training all those muscle groups together, the chances are your performance is going to get affected if you're training in a relatively higher intensity. And also another important factor is that a lot of people see, again, guys who train for strength, they assume that the only thing that they do is squat, deadlift, and bench press. When actually there are a lot more exercises that are, in, uh, that are available and offer many benefits that these lifts don't. So if you, are if you are mindful of those exercises and you incorporate them, there is no way that you would be able to fit uh, all of those exercises into one session or uh, full body session. So this is, again, being practical, uh, an advanced lifter 
considering all those exercises, considering a high intensity uh, training protocol which will require maybe between anywhere between two to four minutes or five minutes of rest between each set, the, the workout would just go too long for them to do a full body session, which is why uh, I went on to talk about uh, two times a week uh, frequency as opposed to three. Makes sense. Louis, what do you think about that? Based on uh, maybe coming from perspective of being a little older, like how much recovery you need and how often you, would you hit each muscle group? What's your experience? Um, with my experience, hitting, it depends. Once again, it depends your lifestyle. Um, do you work 40 hours a week, I have to say? Um, and being your age, uh, me training my body part, like say you're, you said to do chest twice in one day, is that what you no, say? No, not at all. Say you were to do uh, a chest twice shoulder, a week. Shoulder. Yeah, so it would be instead of doing, say, chest, shoulder, triceps, and back biceps and legs or something like that, you would be doing, say, upper, lower, upper, lower. That's it. So four days a week. So you'd be training chest twice a week and back twice a week. But the workouts would relatively be the same time because instead of doing 10 sets of chest in one exercise, you'd be doing five on upper body one I see, and five I see in upper body two. Yeah. So um, the, total, the weekly volume is the same. It's just yes. you're, you're breaking it up to hit each muscle group twice. Right, right. Um, no, I believe that would work. I mean, I, I still go back to old school like Arnold and them. You know, Arnold used to train his chest three times a week. Um, but... A lot of them guys, I know you're both smiling. A lot of them guys, we all know that they were chemically enhanced. I mean, what? Wait, what? No. <laughs> Did they do that? <laughs> but you know, well, and, and people, even when I go to gyms, I live in Florida, man. I mean, you see some guys come in there that are just jacked, okay? Um, but they're they're awesome. They're in shape. You know, veins popping on the legs, and people say certain things about them. I said, but. He just didn't wake up and the muscles got there. He they did the work. Yeah. Thank you. You know, so I say okay to that too, but I just that's something that I'm not into. Um, I'd rather stay little old me and get veiny the way I know, you know, anabolic way or whatever. Uh, but what he's saying makes a lot of sense. Me, I can't do with my time consumption is what I want to say. There's no way I could train. Uh, my chest twice a week. I usually mine was like I said to you earlier, a push pull, push pull, push pull. That was, and that's still what I kind of do now. Um, my volume, and and as I told you once again, that uh, I forget the word. I just call it cycling. You know, uh, I'll go into the eight to ten reps, and then when the winter comes, I'm going to go to three to five reps heavier weight. Uh, but I've I keep to keep bringing up the topic. Um, this with me personal training people and me doing these classes, I have to educate myself more into the crop. People want to do CrossFit. They want to what it is to, and I'm not putting anybody down. What it is to the group that you get is people that want to lose weight. So with this jumping right into jumping jacks, then we do some push-ups, we shake the rope, whatever. That's what they want to do. So with my lifestyle now, you know, the it's hard. I got to constantly, I don't know what you guys eat a week or uh, a day. I mean, I'm up to about 5,000 calories just to maintain. Whoa, it. damn. Yeah, it, it's sad, but that's, I'm burning calories constantly. Um, I'm at 164 pounds. I get on that scale every day, and people look at me and go, you can't eat that much. And I'm like... <laughs> Look in the refrigerator. Um, I don't like to say I eat that much, but that's. I wish I could eat that much. I, yeah, I, I struggle here. with my appetite. <laughs> I, I struggle with my appetite. If I could eat that much, I'd probably be much bigger than. <laughs> well, you gotta you just take just start to take up some CrossFit there, Sunit. Well, not only oh, that, okay. <laughs> us three people in this room, and we're all pretty intelligent with the you know three different body types. Uh, Louis is definitely an ectomorph. Uh, he eats up. Why I'm talking, I'm burning calories. Uh, <laughs> you, know, um, you guys, to me, pretty much, especially City, is an endomorph. He's just a big dude. Um, you know, no, I, no, mean, I just, I no, I'm not. Trust me, I'm not. If you look at my picture, I'm an ectomorph as well. I just look a little bigger right now. Okay. The camera, and because I've, I've pro probably grown a little bit much more than, uh, you know. But yeah, I'm, I'm actually an ectomorph. I think Please, we're. I was yeah, ectomorph. Too. I think we're probably all, all ectomorphs. We just. Uh, I, I when I was like Josh, 16. Josh, maybe you should maybe you should show him my before pic, you know. <laughs> yeah, if, if I had it on, I don't, I don't know. Do you have it anywhere on there? No, we'll we'll uh, no, we'll probably, post them. Maybe if uh, you got them, I'll post them after on the event. 
<laughs> send them to me. Yeah, but definitely it's 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 your activity level and your lifestyle and your schedules that that will definitely influence the type of training you can do as well. So there's all there may be an ideal scenario for that for getting strong or putting on mass, but you we all have lives, right? So yeah. absolutely. I mean, and it's the same thing with shift workers or people that have uh, you know varied schedules or construction workers that have a very high activity level. I mean, that's kind of what you're up to, Louis. You're you're expending calories and you're training basically all day long. So these factors definitely have to be taken into consideration. And uh, with that in mind, uh, Sunit, what, what would you, I mean, we touched briefly on recovery. Um, I mean, sleep is an obvious one. I, I mean, if I've heard seven to nine hours of sleep, of quality sleep, it, it would be ideal. I mean, whether people get that but all the time. And I've also heard that more than nine hours on a regular basis is not necessarily healthy for you either. And less than, you know, six or seven, you're, you're obviously not recovering enough. So in that, in that uh, you know, seven to nine hours quality sleep, uh, outside of that, which I think is pretty straightforward, Nutrition, uh, other recovery techniques. What would your thoughts be on recovery? How long the workout should be? Eating around para workout nutrition. What What do you think? Okay, so first point that I'd like to say is that when if a person needs more than eight hours of sleep in a day, it's because that person's sleep quality sucks. Otherwise, uh, the body just wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't need to sleep that long. So if that person is probably sleeping that much, probably the quality of sleep that they're getting is, is poor. So yeah, um, that's one side of it. I actually did an article on this on my website. Um, I probably can't share it here. You can maybe uh, link it up in the in the video once it's once the hangout is done. But I've taken across various recovery methods that you can do uh, besides sleep as well. Sleep is one of it, of course, but. There are quite a few in there that will help you accelerate recovery, and recovery is a very underrated aspect. It's probably the most underrated aspect of all the, the big three: training, nutrition, and recovery. So I, I think, first of all, nutrition. Yes, of course, because unless and until your body has the raw materials to to build what you've broken down and to build a new uh, enhanced physique or enhanced strength, you, you it's not going to it's not going to work. Along with that, um, you know, there's also adequate rest and recovery between sessions. A lot of people will probably, you know, they, they train their they train their back one day and they train their legs the other day, and uh, you know, the the lower back is taxed and they can't work very well. So that it's it's a very a small aspects like these play a big role in recovery. Uh, water intake is another one. So if you were to go over these points one by one, it really wouldn't make sense. I think it would be best if you guys just link my article, uh, top ten recovery methods. Uh, I, I I'll share it with you, Josh, so you can put it up in the description later on. But that's my okay, perfect. It. Yeah, that sounds good. When I'll uh, I'll touch base with everyone as far as what links and blog posts they want to share. Uh, we'll try and get uh, get Jason and um, Paul uh, Paul's info as well. Louis, any thoughts on recovery with your activity level? You, know, you got such a you know, especially as you get older, things change as well. You need a little bit more time to recover, sleep quality, um, nutrition. Any thoughts? What's worked for you? Um, well, we all know. Uh, I, I don't want to. I don't know what you guys think about supplements, but creatine um, is a good recovery. Um, if anybody touched on that, I don't know. Um, I right now, and that's another thing I want to say. I cycle that stuff. Uh, if I'm going to use creatine um, with a small man like me, it does retain water. It does help me. I think recover quicker, but. I believe it's just like an aspirin. If you take an aspirin a day, you have to build the dose up to two or whatever for it to do the same as it was doing when you were taking one. Um, and why keep taking supplements if it's not going to do the same thing? Um, water, like he said, come on, that's definitely key. Uh, you know, uh, rest, another, what he touched on. Uh, I just, you know, like once again, and I'm going to keep saying this, Everybody's different. Uh, their lifestyle, uh, injury. Um, I don't know how strong Josh is, but he might have a like. Louis got the bad shoulder. Uh, you know, you have to listen to what your body's telling you. With the sleep, I can't control my sleep too much. Uh, I try to. Uh, I, we all know about melatonin. I try and do everything the natural way, and that's the only way I do it. Uh, but still, when I take that, it's like a four to five hour sleep situation. Um, 
pretty much I've been in construction all my life now. I maintain offices, more or less a janitor. I'm not ashamed to say that. It pays the bills. But as you get older, you have to adjust your lifestyle to what your body's capable of. Not saying I can't do construction, but 40 hours on a construction site at 48 years old is just not me anymore, you know. But well, everything he said, I'm a total believer in. You know, and once again, you yourself have to listen to what your body is telling you. You know, uh, if you're injured like me, um, I don't know, what do you think, and I don't want to get off the beaten track, what do you think the, the proper anything you read and what we've been, or what we know is, if you injure yourself two weeks, you know, a good tear, a good sprain, uh, yeah, go to a doctor, we all know that, but pretty much me and you know our body. I mean, two weeks they tell you to lay up. Keep things elevated, uh, rice, you know, uh, rest, ice, compression, exercise. But like I said, I don't want to get off the beaten track. No, no. Well, we've got this part of recovery. I suppose. I mean, with uh, first of all, on creatine. I mean, with, uh, there's different views. Um, a lot of the research now, I think, shows you don't really necessarily need to cycle it. Um, uh, it may have an impact on on recovery, but I mean, primarily, it's for improving strength and and. Uh, Okay. As far as water retention, it's mostly intracellular. Some people may experience that they, they feel bloated, but there shouldn't be, if your diet and everything is good and you're well hydrated, there shouldn't be a lot of uh, extra, like under the skin, water retention. But um, yeah, it's whatever your experience is. I mean, again, t if you don't feel like taking a supplement every day all the time, then that's one thing too. But um, creatine, from my experience, and Sunit, you can pipe in if you have any other, uh, you know, anything other to mention on that. But it's it's pretty well researched as being safe and effective, so it's yeah. th that's definitely a, a creatine, good supplement for that. Creatine is, is, is less of a, of a <coughs> recovery supplement, more of an ergogenic aid, a performance enhancer. And yes, because it pulls in more water, it probably will help you recover. And again, it's, it's about pulling water into the muscles. See, if you understand how, how it's layered, it's skin, then there's fat, then there's yes. muscle. It's intramuscular, so, not intracellular. Yes. So yes. If, if you're talking about water retention and losing sharpness, it, it's it's because of retaining water between in the skin or between the skin and the, and fat. It's not uh, you know within muscle. If 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 there's more water in the muscle, it's not going to make you look smoother. It's not going to make you look bloated. It's just going to make you look a little bigger. And uh, the ex the increased water in the muscles will could probably help in uh, better recovery, but that's it. It's major majorly it's probably a, it's it's a performance enhancer or ergogenic aid. If you're talking about uh, recovery based supplements, uh, one which is again very questioned nowadays, it's, uh, the research is questioning it quite a lot is glutamine. And uh, theoretically, it made a lot of sense to, for it to be you know the go-to supplement. And a lot of people who use it claim that they feel uh, much more. Uh, they, they find themselves recovering a little better, but the research is very overwhelmingly going against it. So I would I don't it know doesn't yeah know. it doesn't necessarily get absorbed get through the um, the intestines yeah. very well. It's very good for gut health, but not necessarily yeah, yeah, for muscular yeah. health. Exactly, it, it it gets soaked in in the in the gut more so than it, uh, for it, it it reaching muscles. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the debate on that side. But that's yeah. pretty much it. I think most of or when it comes to recovery, most of the points where all of us are aware of it, it's more of sticking to it. Because see, we, we are, sometimes we are aware of something, but we just we're hypocritical. I mean, I know that I am. <laughs> uh, I'm the whenever I talk about sleep, I have this smirk in my face because I'm like, dude, you're not the right person to talk about it. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I don't think any of us here are. Sometimes you'll find me up at 3 a.m. in the morning. So that's being really hypocritical. <laughs> but uh, I think all of us are aware of it. It's just that we don't pay too much attention to it. And uh, as you get older, it becomes more and more significant. And, yeah. uh, I guess, no, no, yeah, I'd agree. I mean, uh, rather than um, glutamine, I'd, I think uh, branched-chain amino acids would be something to consider. But if you have a good whey protein supplement, they got a lot of BCAs yeah, in that yeah, as, again, as well. BCA, BCAAs, unless you're, some, unless you're uh, you know, your protein, if your protein intake is high already, yeah. the, the odds of you needing more BCAAs is You just, probably have just, enough, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and for inflammation, uh, as far as injury, um, Sorry about that. For as far as injury, uh, uh, that's my ringtone there. Um, yeah. But uh, it, it, having enough omega threes from fish oil sources is uh, sh should help naturally reduce inflammation in your body all overall. Um, and then I, I usually approach it. Uh, I mean, that's a supplement I'll recommend. Some source of good omega three fats, but. Um, I'll, I'll usually approach an injury from a position of, I mean, if you break something or tear something, you may need to see, obviously, a medical professional. But um, uh, outside of initially um, reducing inflammation and uh, 
immobilizing or at least reducing load on that on the tissue, then I would progress from using uh, active range of motion, which whatever range you can actively achieve without resistance, uh, to uh, uh, isometric resistance. So you, if you only have a limited range, you just gradually work within that range without resistance. And then when you start to recover after a week or two, you can use an isometric hold. So go to the end range that you can maintain with pain-free and up against a wall or a band or against something where you can do a static hold, resist into that weak position just within what's painful for about five to ten seconds, release, engage again, release. So doing isometric or static holds in those positions to start to retrain those muscles that were injured. From that, you go from the isometric training to isolation training. So there you can do your various rotator cuff positions with bands or is isolating and then rear posterior delt. That's where a lot of the isolation work, I do very little isolation work in my most of my training, big compound multi-joint movements. But when you have an injury or a weak link or something that's out of balance that needs to be addressed, going from active range, isometrics, to isolation and then incorporating that weak link back into the chain of the compound movements uh, from there. That's sort of how I would approach it as a, like a quick overview and then also you know your sleep and your your nutrition and your you know icing if needed for keeping inflammation out as necessary. Uh, some people say that even letting it letting inflammation take its course initially for the first few days helps. Exactly. Uh, there's uh, things that letting the inflammation helps the, re the recovery process so that's something you need to look into. I mean, you need to look at function and comfort versus of course and whether you know taking <laughs> taking taking Advils and icing it for the first couple of days. Maybe that's not ideal for the healing process. But if you're in pain and you gotta you gotta we live right too. So exactly. it's a balancing act there. But def definitely after several days, uh, you I mean helping that inflammation work itself out and helping get some active stability in those ranges of motion will. It, that's what I'd recommend before getting back into the big compound multi-joint movements where you're going to be compensating all over the place for that. Yep. Uh, so I, I look at it as an active recovery process if, as long as something's not broken or torn uh, versus just a passive waiting for things to get better process because sitting on your butt and just resting like uh, <laughs> completely not doing anything it might not hurt as much but as soon as you go to, to do something again you're that's not ready for it. The, that's probably going to make it worse because guess yeah. what? A lot of people tend to assume that uh, the best way to go about <coughs> is to completely eliminate activity. But here's the thing: uh, say and you know, muscle misusing a muscle is bad. You know, training it the wrong way is bad. But muscle disuse is worse because guess what? There's a joint, say a knee joint, for example. If you're injured at the knee, a lot of people will eliminate any form of leg exercise. It's like the best excuse they can get, right? I don't have to. I can skip leg day now. Yeah. But here's the thing: uh, it's it's the muscles and the strength of your muscles that actually preserve and pad your joints. And if you don't work out, what's going to happen? Your muscles are going to atrophy. The weaker your muscles get, the more vulnerable your knee joint gets. So you've got to find that balance between training the muscle, but at the same time not hurting the joint, not impeding its recovery process and that is very tricky. In many ways it's very tricky and uh, myself actually I did have an, exp uh, an injury. I have torn my right ankle because I play basketball and I tore it very bad and because of that I subsequently it led to a jumpers near my left knee because of compensation, compensatory patterns. And I was stuck with it for two years and guess what? The thing that helped me get out of it was deep squatting. Mm -hmm. Squatting deep is what helped me recover from my, I started squatting really low and pushing myself to go even, to go ass to grass. And within two months of that, something that was stuck with me for two years is gone. And I have a physiological explanation for this as well as to why it's happened and why this works better, why deep squats actually help you, help me. And I've done a video again on my channel recently, how I fixed my jumper's knee, which is when I described physiologically and biomechanically why uh, deep squatting actually helped me uh, improve my condition of my knee. Uh, but if you if you're interested, if anybody's interested, you can check that out. But that's the point. It's about training so that you can maintain the size and the strength, the strength, strength of your muscles, so that at least your joints are, are prevent are padded, and there's not not vulnerable to more stress. But at the same time, you don't want to impede on the recovery of the joint itself. So that fine line is what you have to find the balance. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, it's all about progression too. Like, I still think you can you can work up from uh, you know gradual range of motion, increase your range progressively, resistance, etc. Definitely, but do active active recovery would be the, the key to that. Listen, guys, we've we've got we've covered a lot. Um, it's it's been a little over an hour, so um, I'd like to wrap it up with any final thoughts on this. And I think there's definitely a lot more to discuss on this topic. And um, I'd like to uh, set up another one of these discussions in the very near future as a roundtable. And if either of you would like to uh, have a one-on-one -on -one chat and get into a specific topic uh, of your expertise or experience, talk to me after and let's set that up as well. So definitely let's revisit this. Um, but uh, before we go, any final thoughts or any uh, also let people know how they can in get in touch with you. Louis? Um, I just want to say thank you so much because, um, like I told you at the beginning of it, what I've been doing for a while, almost a year on here, and it's just, like I said, it, it's hard to get three people like this to all talk and be almost physical fitness minded. Uh, this is very well uh, managed, this hangout. Uh, you know, so with that being said, it's just a great thing. You know, we don't have people popping in here not talking about fitness or didn't have anything to add to it. So that is just a pleasure to me because if you can find somebody with knowledge and take a little of what, you know, Saeed knows, what Josh knows, and Louie can take it and take it to hit the gym or just keep it for himself or whatever. I like to spread it around. I like to spread knowledge. Um, it, what you're doing is great. So I'm, I'm happy, and I'm definitely going to stay here after you, you know, go off air and try and, you know, either – I think I've circled you, Josh, so you're in my circles. Um, it's hard to circle when people keep circling you. You have to, like, delete to circle somebody else. So I'm going to try and circle Sadiq. But, yeah, I'm happy, man. And that's, you know, that's just my thought. Excellent. Thanks for joining us today, Louie. I'm glad you can make it. Uh, Sunit. Any, uh, yeah, same here. Uh, thanks. thanks for having me, Josh. It was really, uh, we touched upon quite a few topics. We did deviate quite a bit from our original discussion, which is supposed to be on training for strength and size, but yeah. that's, I guess that's what happens when you put yeah, it, people Yeah, I think a lot and, yeah. of it's re related. We can we can all tie it. We yeah, could tie yeah. it in somehow. And that's, yeah. uh, that's what the group discussions will sort of, they'll grow organically like that. But yeah, it was fun. Absolutely. And I think it's, in, in a way, we probably... Uh, in, instead of going maybe that specific into one thing we did, discuss a lot of topics which would be interesting for other people and practically and practically applicable for a lot of people as well. So I guess that's good. And, Absolutely. Uh, final on yeah, that's and about contacting me. Uh, well, if you got my you got my link, my website down below, so you can take, check out www.sebastianfitnesssolutions.com. I'm also on YouTube, so you can search search my name, Sunit Sebastian or Sebastian Fitness, whatever, and you'll find me there. Subscribe to my channel, and you'll see, you know, you'll, you'll get regular updates on good content, and that's all that it is, man. Thanks for Excellent. having me. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Sunit, and let's definitely set up uh, another one-on-one -on -one soon too. Want to hit some specific topics? All right, all right. That uh, this has been Jim Chat number two thirteen roundtable discussion. I'd also like to thank Jason for joining us earlier uh, at last minute notice from his from his car. That's great. And Paul Marsland as well uh, from the UK. And uh, he had a little technical issues at the beginning. We'll definitely have him back as well. Uh, thanks, Louis. Thanks, Sunit. Um, we're going to sign off, and we'll look forward to um, touching base with these uh, these experts next time as well. All of their contact information links will be placed below when this video will be posted live for you to enjoy. Until next time, stay strong.